All right, everybody, let's get today's program started. Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It is great to be with you again for another edition of our program. We gather right here around the glow of the Museum of North Carolina, uh, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences YouTube channel. In order to meet interesting people who are doing really cool and interesting work out there in the world of science, nature, conservation, education, and more. And today we've got a great show for you. Uh, every Wednesday at noon, just about, we all gather right here. And we've been doing this for a long time now. We've met some incredible people. And uh, the folks with the Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality have been hitting it out of the park with bringing just amazing storytellers, bringing awesome topics for us to talk about, discuss for all of you watching to be able to ask questions of. We've had a great time. Uh, you can even scroll back in the YouTube playlist for the Lunchtime Discovery Series and see some of the amazing presentations and conversations that we've been having. I encourage you to do that. Uh, if you scroll back far enough, just keep going back in that playlist. Uh, more than once or twice now, we've heard from this incredible organization, OSurge. We've heard from some of their scientists and we've heard from the founder. And today, I'm so thrilled, so excited to be able to bring him back onto the show. Everybody, it's Chris Fisher. He's the founder of OSearch and uh, the expedition leader, and he joins me now. Hey, Chris. Hey, how's everybody doing? It's great to be here. Doing really great. I'm really excited for uh, your presentation because as I understand it, OSearch just completed its 45th expedition. Is that right? Yes, we did. We just completed our 45th expedition, which was off of the Outer Banks. And did it right off of North Carolina. We'll mark that as a pretty good milestone for us and for you. Yes. I mean, you know, look, we love it there. The big challenge is the weather, but the life is there. The water is there. It's a gorgeous place. Special place on the ocean, really reaching out into the ocean so close to the Gulf Stream. True enough. Yeah, I think uh, ask anybody who lives in North Carolina about the weather. We'll tell you to... Uh, Bring a raincoat and some sunscreen and your windbreaker <laughs> all for one day. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's for sure. No, that's uh, it's a very dynamic place. Uh, you know, it's, uh, that's why the white sharks are there. You know, we'll talk about that a little bit. I'm excited to learn more. I'll turn it over to you. Oh, okay, great. All right. Well, I'm going to try to take a second here and share a screen. See if we can pull that off real quick. Perfect. I'll remind all right. you. They can ask questions in the chat as we go along. And after the presentation, I'll share our viewers' thoughts over here into the live stream. Okay, okay. great. Go for it. All right. So let's just talk a little bit about why OSearch is up there, what we're doing in, in the whole big picture, right? So we're going to go through a little bit of the setup of what's going on, and then we're going to talk the specifics of mm -hmm. what we saw while we were there. Um, so OSearch's mission, when I founded OSearch a long time ago, um, the main issue at hand at the time was the science community was coming to us and saying, we're down to 9% of our large sharks. And they were starting to see ecosystems unravel. This is around 2005, 2006. Now, we knew we had a shark problem because we began protecting our sharks around 1990 and changing regulations for them to rebuild. But these animals take decades to rebuild because many of them can't begin to have babies for up to 20 years. So it's a very slow rebuild. So around 1990, they protect, protected sharks. And around 2006, a paper came out that said we were down to 9% of our large sharks. At the time, we were helping scientists study other species of fish. And quite frankly, they looked at us and they said, if you don't help them figure out the shark thing, this other stuff we're doing is not going to matter. That's how important the sharks are to the ocean. They are the system manager, the balance keeper. So our mission at that time, we pivoted, it was 2007 from what we were doing, uh, helping researchers study other fish and making TV shows about big game fishing moving around the world. And we pivoted 100% to science and exploration and focusing on this large shark issue that the planet was dealing with. And so that's why our mission is to return the oceans to balance and abundance. Uh, and it just so happens that the pathway to do that goes through are large sharks because they are the top of the food chain and the system managers there. Uh, the reason why we lost so many of them is um, for a lot of reasons, but primarily shark fin soup over in Asia in the, in the 90s and early 2000s, the wealth of that area was exploding. The demand for 
uh, shark fin soup, which was previously reserved for the elites, exploded across the general population, which is massive there. And it became in the best financial interest of fishermen, the commercial fishermen, oftentimes high seas, foreign fleets operating illegally, to go out and catch sharks, capture them, chop off their fins, dump their bodies, and try to load the, the boat up with fins. Uh, because the fins were worth many times more than the meat, and they didn't want to fill their boat up with the bodies of the sharks. They wanted to fill it up with all fins. This crashed our shark populations, and we were seeing devastating impacts uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, and that's the reason why they began to get protection around the world. And so this ripple effect was affecting all sorts of other ecosystems uh, because the white shark is the apex predator, the balance keeper of the system. To help people understand this, one white shark swimming up and down the shores up in the northern latitudes, up in New England and Atlantic Canada, one shark swimming up and down a beach of a thousand seals keeps all those seals stuck on the beach because they know if they go out that there's a white shark there. So they'll stay there till they're almost starving. They'll go get a little bit of food and then they jump back out. We know if that white shark is not there, all of those seals eat four times more per day. So in reality, what's going on is the white sharks are guarding or protecting our fish stocks from this next tier of the food web. Now, people think like, oh, wow, they must eat a lot of seals. Well, it's not really about how many seals they eat. That's why I changed this slide from kind of the old pyramid you would see of the food chain to one that was just a little bit different shape because the white sharks, while they do eat some seals up north, the main thing is that their mere presence, the, the, the fact that they're there affects the behavior of all of the seals. Yes, it eats the odd seal, but its mere presence affects the behavior of them all. And that's really what the apex predators and systems do, right? <clears throat> Pardon me. When they breeze through a system or they move through a system, Everything in the system knows they're there and everything into the system behaves the way it is supposed to for a balanced, abundant system. <clears throat> if the white shark is removed, then they can behave in different ways. For example, they can go forage all the time. They don't have to hide half the day. And then we get this situation where we have over foraging at every level and we see these big systems collapse. Down uh, off the Carolinas where you are, they're putting a lot of pressure on squid to keep them down lower every night when they migrate to the surface, as the squid do. And what that does is that prevents the squid from eating all of our fish that are growing up, all the fry, like all the baby mahi, all the baby wahoo, all the baby billfish, the baby tuna. But the presence of the sharks keeps the squid down because sharks eat a lot of squid. And um, if they're not there, those squid rise right up to the surface. They wipe out all of the baby fish that we need to grow up to become the fish that we eat and that we see in the ocean, all the big tuna, other game fish, and the, and the fish that we eat. So you can't manage the system if you can't manage the system manager. And the system manager in this case are our large sharks or the great white shark. So we are trying to return them to balance and abundance, which then moves the entire system toward balance and abundance. So remember, our goal when we started was to move the system to balance abundance, and then we end up finding ourselves that that, ha that path goes through great white sharks. So we're ocean abundance people, not so much shark people. Uh, it's just that that's where we find ourselves, and we needed a new level of technology, a new level of collaboration, because the scientists did not have the capacity to understand the white sharks' lives in any of the nine populations of white sharks around the world. So when you look at this slide here, imagine that you got these nine major shark populations. These are great white shark populations. You can see they move over massive areas. If you look at the orange, you can see that's the range of the white shark that lives off the east coast of the United States, the orange one, number one. So that's the study that we find ourselves getting close to the end of now. But you can see that the white shark is ranging all the way from beyond Newfoundland across uh, down the East Coast and across the Gulf of Mexico. So they are the balance keeper across that entire range. If the white sharks are thriving, that system is thriving. Our kids are going to see an ocean full of fish. 
That is one of the nine populations, and we just are completing, for the first time in history, solving their full life history puzzle of the white shark. That is the data you need to manage them. What is the life history puzzle? That's birthing, the nursery, how the nursery expands, full migratory range, how old are they when they become sexually mature and can mate, where is that mating site, and then what are they eating? And what's their toxicological profile? So when you understand that information, you can actually then begin to manage that species. So for the first time in history, in puzzle number one, we are there. Um, our government, our states, they can manage our white sharks um, uh, with the data that we've provided as, as part of the 80 peer-reviewed papers that we have already published. Now, there's eight more puzzles to go. But you can see what a contribution it would be to the future of the planet if, as an organization, we could solve these nine white shark population puzzles. So then all of those regions, they can manage these large sharks, which means they now have control of moving the system toward abundance. Until they can manage these big sharks, they're just guessing and hoping that it, if they do something, it will positively affect the population. But they, they, they aren't really predictably doing it. So leverageable data for management is what we're after. Leverageable data for management. Oftentimes you see all these projects going on and you're like, well, that's cool, but is it a leverageable data for management? <laughs> that's what matters, right? So that's all we're chasing because we're chasing impact. So it became clear when we started on this journey that um, we weren't going to be able to do things the old way, right? The way that science has been done traditionally. Science, and still today, in the most part of research, is really driven by a system that is driving people to publish or perish. That means they, scientists, are in silos, working you know, on their own projects, but in essence, competing with each other, trying to beat each other so they can publish so that then they get more grants, right? And here's, and if you get the grants, then you can do the work, then you can publish, right? But what it, what it does is the scientists don't want to share their data with other scientists. The system is forcing them to compete. Well, if we're down to 9% of our large sharks and we're running out of time and we don't have the data, we simply don't have time for such an archaic, inefficient, non-ocean first system, right? This is not just about hey, how do we get the data we need now to make sure all of our grandkids can see fish and eat a fish sandwich? That is not how the system is defined, right? So everyone's vision, a common, their vision, the vision for the system does not equate to a vision that is the most efficient path to actually getting there for the ocean space. So I don't come from the ocean space, so I don't have to play by their rules, right? So what we're going to do, uh, I, I come from the ocean space, but I don't come from the academic space. Right. So uh, I, we don't have to follow those rules. And quite frankly, when I set O search up, I didn't understand that's how the science community worked. I just tried to build the most efficient system I could to tackle this large shark problem. And that was going to be about collaboration. There could no longer be all the scientists in silos. There could no longer be communities where there's the fishermen and then there's the scientists and there's distrust. Right. Oh, look at the dumb fishermen. Oh, look at the arrogant scientists. Right? Our grandkids got no time for that sort of adolescent behavior. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a common vision. Well, no matter who you talk to, if you ask them, hey, raise your hand if you'd like to see if you'd like your grandkids see an ocean full of fish, everybody in the room raises their hand. Right. Every scientist raises their hand. Every fisherman raises their hand, you know, who uh, is thinking about what we leave behind for our kids. And so if we create a common vision around that, then there is no more us and them. There's just us all moving toward an abundant ocean for our kids. And so what we, we were really to do at OSEARCH was to get people to drop their old fears, drop the old ways, and just come together, together on a vision that was just great-grandchildren first. And so that allowed us all of a sudden to have our world's best watermen, practical knowledge, the people who are on the water every day, working with our world's best academics who need to collect data and publish papers that can be leveraged for policy and management. Instead of two separate communities and different agendas, we just became one thing on a mission, 
to do what everyone says was impossible, solve the life history puzzle of a population of white sharks and include the world in the journey. And the way to do that on the collaborative side, on the scientist side, because this is about data collection and data deficit is the challenge, was to get them to break down this old siloed way and come together around every single animal we touch, right? That's a couple of things. I was I was very passionate about coming together around every single animal we touched. I talked to scientists. I don't want to work with them. Can't you take them out and then take me out and, and do various different things? I'm like, think about that. You do not honor and respect the beast. If you honor the beast and we have to catch this thing and present it to a group of scientists to collect data to make sure our kids see an ocean full of fish, then we want to do that touching the least amount of animals. And if we're going to put it through the process, we must have every scientist collecting every data set off the same animals because then we touch the fewest amount of animals possible to solve the puzzle to save the rest. Right. So this collaboration, I, 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 you know, there were people when we started trying to collaborate and I'm not going to harp on it too long, but this is a different way. This is the new way. This is the great grandchildren first way. And um, it was a threat to OSEARCH 10 years ago, 11 years ago that we were getting people to collaborate. Other people in the space didn't like that and actually leveraged their positions in this place to dissuade it. They didn't want to see all the other scientists coming up. You know, so that was actually a threat in the beginning. So this collaboration, the fact that now it's normal now, here we are 12 years later, it was a bunch of a few of just kind of the old boys, so to speak, you know, that come from the old way, all the young people coming up are totally into collaborating. And now I'm happy to say on this particular project, we have almost 50 scientists, 49 scientists doing 25 research projects on every animal we touch, maximizing the leap forward in data collection and knowledge each time we touch an animal. So this collaboration is game changing across disciplines and within disciplines. Uh, here's a little um, here's a little film on collaboration. So starting almost 10 years ago, we were at ground zero with our knowledge of this population of the white shark. It was actually one of the poorest known populations in all the world. And now we have elevated our knowledge of this population from one of the least understood to one of the best. In the Western North Atlantic White Shark Project, it has grown to the point where we now have 25 different projects. We do a very specific set of uh, biological samples on these animals. We collect blood samples that go to multiple projects, muscle samples that go to multiple projects. We do an ultrasound that can inform many different aspects of the animal. We collect semen samples, which can tell us many different aspects of the animal. Um, and ultimately, all of those samples help inform other projects. The how do all these projects work together is really important as far as really increasing our rate of learning about these animals. And it's not just trying to answer your question, but seeing how your question fits in with other projects. So for example, when we have um, toxicology studies, we can really look at whether the toxins they're detecting are impacting the animal's health. With the nutrition study, there are certain micronutrients um, that can impact how toxins affect an animal. And we can look at the toxins that they're seeing and whether those nutrients are high or low, in which case they might be being depleted. It's all of those bigger questions of how these projects relate together and answer each other's additional questions that makes this such a strong project and such a strong collaboration. One of my roles here with OSEARCH is looking at movements and migration of these animals, um, using multiple forms of telemetry to better understand you know, where they go, when they go there, and, and the ultimately why they go there. And, and to truly understand the why, you need to know other aspects about their biology and being able to understand a bit about their diet, the health of the animals, the reproductive status of the animals, which are all of these other projects, allow us to really expand the scope of the work that we do, not only with the movements and migration, but also better understanding the population as a whole so it not only allows us to be much more efficient, but it also reveals insights that we wouldn't be able to really understand if we were only single focused on one particular thing. 
So this collaboration has brought together a lot of different researchers and a lot of different institutions. Um, and they may have very different perspectives on the different questions and different tools to answer those questions. So it's been a great way to introduce different methodologies into different projects and really expand what each project can do by having other institutions that you can work with. We took this different approach, this OSEARCH science model of super collaboration to maximize and accelerate the process of, of understanding. We're trying to get the ocean back to its natural abundance and balance in as quick a time as possible. Okay, how do I jump out of this? Okay, so you can see collaboration is a big part of who we are. Let's see here. I'm sorry, I'm having a little problem here because I'm in this video and I'm trying to get out of it. There we go. Okay, so on our, now let's talk about this specific expedition. We're going to talk about um, the four sharks that we tagged when we were up there and what our objectives was. We had two objectives. Uh, number one was you know, we don't have any data on the general physiological profile from animals off North Carolina this week, this time of year, which we were there in late April and early May. And so what we're doing is we have the physiological profile from their lives up north in Canada, off the northeast, down below you guys, uh, off Georgia and northeast Florida, but not this time of year. So we want to get the physiological profile of all animals, right? So they'll compare that and they'll like things like diet. They'll know what they're eating differently there than they're eating up north. They'll get their toxicological profile, their toxicology, what toxins are in the animal. We're seeing them change as they move from north to south, depending upon what they're eating. This is an important thing that you should understand. So Osar, uh, sharks are at the top of the food chain, right? So what that means is they are a bioaccumulator. So we were talking about toxicology. So little fish eat things and they get toxins in them. A bigger fish, fish eats them. A bigger fish eats that one. All the toxins pass up the food chain and eventually they end up in the white shark at the top of the food chain because the toxins have accumulated moving up. So the toxicological profile of the white shark gives you the general ocean health of the entire region and their entire range. So that can start to help us understand what are we putting in the water that maybe a tiny fish is eating because it's in a plant and then accumulates all the way up into the system so we can affect change on land if it's required. And we have to at least know where it's coming from. So we wanted to get that. The, second, the other uh, objective was trying to find some mature animals because we believe the animals are mating in that region during the March, April, May timeframe because we've captured two animals that showed reproductive readiness and we've never of the 90, oh goodness, where are we now? I think we're somewhere around 94 sharks or 95 sharks. Um, of the remaining uh, of all of those sharks across all of the rest of their range, we have not found an animal that was reproductively ready. So we know where they are not mating. The question is, where are they mating? <clears throat> and the two, we've caught two animals <clears throat> off your region of the world during this time of year that were the closest <clears throat> we've seen to reproductively ready. So, and that was earlier, that was like in February. So we thought a little bit later, you know, they were maybe ramping up. So that was the secondary one. But in order to do that, you got to, you got to see white sharks over 14 feet. These particular sharks, <clears throat> pardon me, are all 13 and a half feet and under. Excuse me for a minute here. The closest one we had to a mature animal was Umi. Umi was 13 and a half feet long. And Umi was very close. We weren't really sure when we pulled her on if she was sexually mature yet or not. She's right on the cusp. Uh, the other animals were a little shorter. So no, they weren't. But we do have, now have their physiological profile. 
one of the things for you guys to watch on the tracker right now, if any of you all use the OSearch free tracking app or OSearch.org where you can track all these animals is, we don't know if these are going to be Canadian white sharks or if they're going to be sharks that go up to New England. And we identify that by where they go for their summer and fall feeding aggregations because they go back to the same areas to feed every summer and fall, almost like a salmon to a river. So they have the site fidelity that they go back to. So we'll, it'll be interesting to see um, where whether these animals spend their summers up in Atlanta, Canada or on the northeastern United States. Typically coming out of the southeastern United States, across all of our sharks that we've tagged in the southeastern United States, it's roughly split 50-50. It's very close to 50-50. Half of the sharks bypass New England and go straight to Atlantic Canada. Half the uh, sharks go to the New England region. So it'll be really fun to see where these animals end up in another month or two. So what this super kind of collaborative approach has done, and as far as accelerating learning, bringing the fishermen and the scientists together, bringing the scientists together, um, it's taken us in 2012 when we started on the left-hand side of your screen, you're seeing the, the real-time tracking data that existed for white sharks off the East Coast of the United States. You see data deficit, right? Ground zero. There was some other tags that had been poked into sharks that were being used, a little bit more primitive kind of approach, less clinical, that gave us some ideas of movement. Uh, but not a lot. We had sightings data, of course, and incidents data. But now you just jump forward here, really about seven years, six to seven years of focusing on this project. And you can see the massive amount of data of all of the sharks covering up the East Coast of the United States and all of their movements. So a radical leap forward in data collection and knowledge. Now that mixed with all of the different studies on reproduction and diet and everything else is going to allow us to reveal this life history puzzle is what's needed for management. This is a video here now, since we're talking about North Carolina and the tracks and what's going on of, of the recap video of the expedition we just came off the water from. has been amazing progress. It's a testament to just collaboration, teamwork, a common vision with a selfless disposition amongst all the members of the team. We have the most leverageable data for management of the white shark population now here than any other population in the world. So the future's bright for white sharks on the East Coast, which means the future's bright for humans off the East Coast. Expedition 45 in North Carolina started off with just an unbelievable weather window. We were able to get outside the Outer Banks just offshore of Ocracoke in North Carolina, and we were seeing sharks every day. There were two primary missions. Number one is to continue to close the gap on this mating, so we needed to see mature animals to do that. But also number two was to sample other animals in this region at this time so the scientists could understand how their physiological makeup looked compared to other parts of their migratory range. And we were humming with that. We saw four white sharks that we captured and tagged, saw another three or four that we did not. The main reason we're studying these white sharks is not only to understand where they are, but where they are and what they're doing and why they're doing it. So we can leverage that to manage them back to abundance to make sure they're thriving off the East Coast, which means humans will be thriving. So this has been an unbelievable project as we get near the end. I mean, we now know where our white sharks are going, what they're doing when they go there, and why they go there. We have 80 peer-reviewed papers at OSEARCH now about this work and our other work around the world. And that is truly leverageable data for management. For the first time in history, all the states and the federal government across the United States and the provinces up in Canada can now actually manage white sharks. And that is the key so that we can create our own path toward abundance in the ocean.
we've got we've got our experts working on it. And Brent, I will wait for your your we've go. Got, we've got our experts working on it. All right, we're back. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Apologies. So what we're looking at now is the life history puzzle of the white sharks and all of those tracks that you saw previously. How do they unfold into the life? What's the story of the life of the white shark? So we're going to back up to where they're born here. They're born right here in the New York, New Jersey bite in the spring and early summer. This is a perfect place for a white shark to drop off a baby, uh, you know, it's pups, right? I mean, it's hundreds or thousands of acres of bait there. Menhaden squid and mackerel, game fish on that. Perfect place for a four and a half foot future balance keeper to balance this little inshore system and, and become what we need it to become, the guardian of our fish stocks, right? So the, they'll stay there from the spring until the fall of their first year, this primary nursery up here off New York, New Jersey bite. And then they slide down off of your region of the world, off the lower outer banks and down into South Carolina is their primary winter habitat in their first year of life. So now every year as it gets hot in this early summer, late spring, they get pushed up north. Remember, white sharks are the balance keepers of the temperate ocean. They like that 55 to 70 degree water. They don't like it when it gets much hotter than that. Then it becomes more tropical and you have the tropical balance keeper move into those warm waters, which would be the tiger shark. So these they move up here when it gets too hot back up here their first year and they expand that range every year year two, year three, by the time they're four years old, these white sharks are migrating all the way from Newfoundland around the tip of Florida and into the Gulf of Mexico. Now they'll do that for the first 20 years of their life. And then the, the males will continue to do that, right? Because their life is not interrupted by pregnancy and gestation and birthing. So they'll make the seasonal movement every year, pretty simple pattern, right? All immature animals and mature males, we believe when these females successfully mate down here where this gray area is, where we got this mating symbol, kind of in the March, April, May time frame, that we're then seeing this odd movement of big mature females that shoot way offshore. Some of them come out as far as the mid-Atlantic Ridge. And we believe that is large females gestating, right? They're already pregnant. Mating is violent. They want to lead a low-risk lifestyle and just gestate and grow their babies. So they go out there, and they're going up and down with that deep scattering layer, that mesopelagic layer. We're seeing them down deep during the day, feeding on all these fish in the dark, a lot of squid. And then when that rises up at night, they rise up with it, and they feed on them at night up near the surface. And they do that for about a year, <clears throat> And then in, in the spring of the following year, that kind of May, June time frame, the females will make their way back into the New York, New Jersey bite to drop off their pups and start this cycle all over again. So when you understand the life of a white shark like that, you know, you can make decisions like, OK, we know we can't be, let's say, for example, someone wanted to gill net all of that bait and everything that's in the New York, New Jersey bite. And they wanted to do it in the summer and, and fall. Well, you can't do that because that's the that is the birthing site and the primary nursery of our balance keeper at that time. However, they are all out of the region by about December. So there might be a window of work for us that you could do some work to catch fish because people need to catch fish. People want to eat fish. It's part of life. We have to find a centrist path, a smart path, you know, in this other season when they're not here. Right. And then you can you can um, leverage the idea of that across their entire range. Right. If you understand the life history, you can make sure you don't accidentally make a mistake because I'm happy to report that we are in a situation now where our white shark numbers are slowly and steadily rising. As we talked about before, they can't really rise that fast because they have to live 20 years to replace themselves. And then they have a few babies every other year. So you're going to we're just in the middle of this beautiful, slow and steady recovery from maybe like you know, 9% of our large sharks off the East Coast back in the, you know, 1990 to, you know, somewhere close to 20% now. I mean, we're, we're trending. We're winning. We are winning. We're winning off the whole East Coast. 
The East Coast is more abundant now than it has been since the 40s or 50s. We're seeing things that people haven't seen on the ocean since our great grandfathers. So uh, everyone should know that off the East Coast of the United States, it is teeming with life and we are turning it back into one of the great wild oceans again. And you should be celebrating that. Um, but, uh, that is because of the return of the sharks. Also excellent management, uh, back in the late nineties, <clears throat> sorry, late eighties, early nineties, when the States and NOAA were trying to bring the recreational fishing economy back, it had collapsed in the late eighties and early nineties. No one was buying boats. No one was chartering fishing boats. No one was going fishing because we had crushed the ocean and it was highly compromised. There was not a lot to catch in an effort to bring that economy back. Most of the states along the East Coast, except for North Carolina, I would say, banned inshore gill nets. And there's still inshore gill netting in North Carolina, for any of you all who don't know that. But most places have gotten rid of inshore gill nets. What that did was that allowed all the game fish and the sharks that were moving up and down the beaches, they were no longer uh, being gill netted. And quite, they were gill netting the birthing site back in the late 80s. Unbeknownst to them, they didn't know that it was the birthing site. So um, when we removed those gill nets, we protected our sharks. And here we are 30 years later, and the ocean is teeming. Our game fish have come back because of that move as well. And then the introduction of things like slot limits has been hugely successful in making sure we maintain good brood stocks across these populations. And, <clears throat> you know, one of the things I get passionate about is in the nonprofit space, all you hear is doom and gloom, especially from nonprofit organizations. Because you know why? When you hear doom and gloom, the cash flows. But we, this is a place, we are winning. And your children need to know we're winning. So they're not worried about growing up in a place where the, they're not going to have life around them. I, I, I lecture to a lot of colleges. I teach kids. I got kids coming to me. They're worried that there's not going to be a place for them to live. And it is a weird psychological burden to put on a kid that is a result of the hype of how bad the sky is falling when it comes to climate change. And when it comes to fisheries management, and it's unfair and it's exaggerated. So we need to make sure when we're in a situation where we are winning, like we are winning off the East Coast of the United States, number one, it demonstrates that we can win anywhere in the world with a few key moves. And number two, our kids need to know that so that they're excited about their future, not afraid of it. And it is real. I'm seeing it. Make sure your kids know we are winning off your beaches and you, they are going to see an ocean full of fish their whole life. It is, it is a weird anomaly that I see when I talk to kids and talk to their teachers. That's something we all need to focus on because we can't have our kids growing up thinking that way. It's, it's not a real bright vision for them. And it's not in this particular part of the world, at this particular time, we are winning and we are winning big. And I think anyone who's who's watching this, who fishes regularly, who's on the water regularly, if you really start looking, you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm not used to seeing so much bait. Oh, my gosh, I'm not used to seeing the game fish all the time and the porpoise. And we save the whales and we've saved the turtles. And there's still a few we need to work on. But by and large, generally speaking, winning. Right. And this is the model what's going on off your beaches to share with the rest of the world who are frustrated and don't feel like maybe they can bring their region back. We've we've this is 30 years and it is a phenomenal recovery and it's still trending super positive. So it's just going to get better and better. OK. So, you know, one of the things that's important is to make sure that the kids know what's going on, which I just, you know, I get passionate about it, man. And uh, so when we started the tracker back in 2012, all the kids poured in, they wanted to track the sharks. And then the teachers started leveraging the tracker to teach the kids math and measurements and oceanography and geography because they move such vast distances. So when we saw that, we were able to go out and get a fully uh, accredited STEM-based educational curriculum written and integrated into the real-time tracking of the sharks. So for any of you all that are out there, it's free. It's fully downloadable. You just go to osearch.org and you go to programs and kick on the education tab and you will see all of these amazing, you know, um, curriculums that are integrated into the tracker. And so the kids and the families have poured in and used this together because in the end, it's all for them. In the end, we got to pass it off to them. And so why not get them in the game as early as possible so that they can become, right, 
an educated centrist ambassador advocate for the ocean. One of the big challenges we face are these polarizing groups. Doesn't matter if they're a preservationist or if they're a poacher, right? These fringe groups, they're so position oriented, they prevent us from getting to practical solutions and paths in the middle that accommodate all the parties involved in the ocean space so we can actually create positive trajectory. And if they're holding, they hold on to their positions, it's all or nothing. And then they prevent that, right? And so it's really about the middle here. The answer is typically in the middle because there's a lot of people that have lives. People want to eat fish. People have careers on the water working. We need to be smart so that we do it in a way that creates an abundant future. And, um, and, and you also want people on the water. You want people in the water because no one wants to save the forest they can't walk in, right? So you want people embracing it, loving it, and then they want to look after it. And we want them to be centrists and data-driven. The path to abundance is unemotional. It's just math and science. And when you get the emotions of the polarizing fringes invading the practical, commonsensical center, the preservationist is just as bad as the poacher. And that is just real, practical, on the ground, the way it works. Now is not a time to be afraid to stand next to common sense, right? That's where the answer is 90% of the time. So that's where we drive all of our information. And we want our kids growing up that way. Because if you get people in this space that are too emotional about the subject, they undermine the very thing they're trying to save. Um, you know, you can track all of the um, all of this work, as I mentioned, uh, at the OSearch free app on both the Droid and the Apple, as well as OSearch.org, where you'll find the curriculums and a lot of other things. So go dive into this. One of the unique things that's also with the collaboration about OSearch is we've transformed kind of the concept of the ownership of data and sharing different layers of data so that you don't compromise publishing or other things. And so in 2012, when we began the tracker, it was a big deal. It was a, because no one had ever put their data out there like that. And um, what that did was it allowed us to include the world in the project, right? Because in the end, it's going to take us all anyway. And the kids are the future ambassadors. So we all got to be in it to win it. Um, over the years now, we just completed this slide says 44 expeditions, but it's 45 now. We, you know, we've touched a lot of animals. We helped a lot of institutions and we've published a lot of papers in a short period of time. And that's just a result of an efficient collaborative system. That's all it is. An efficient collaborative system that's great grandchildren and ocean first. And that is really how we test every decision we make and test what we do. Um, and it actually makes decision making very easy because it drives out any sort of individual personal bias you might have. What's ocean first? What's great grandchildren first? We don't know what to do. What's great grandchildren first? <laughs> it's usually pretty easy, right? So that's what's driven OSEARCH. You know, and in the end, the most important thing is it's going to take us all. We all got to try to live the most efficient lives we can, try to re eliminate how much waste and garbage you consume. Uh, just try to lead a nice, efficient life on your journey. When you go down to the beach and you're hanging out, enjoying yourself, if you see a piece of trash, pick it up. We got to attack this thing like a swarm of bees. It's not going to be one group that's going to come in and save the day for all of us. It's going to take us all. And anything is possible. If you don't care, it gets the credit. Who cares? It's not about that. It is about great-grandchildren and an abundant ocean. And that is really the story of OSEARCH and an update on North Carolina, which I think leaves us a few minutes for some questions. It does indeed. Chris, incredible stuff. Thank you for sharing today. Pleasure. It's a privilege to do it, man. Really enjoy it. Um, I mean, first of all, your team gets some of the most incredible pictures and videos of the animals and the work that that might be out there on the web so like hats off to your like photography and communications people because y'all knock it out of the park well we Incredible knew stuff. so when we started this journey we knew and in, in really for the sharks we knew that we not only had to solve the science puzzle but we knew we had to shift the tone of the conversation around sharks right 
um, because uh, if people didn't understand how important they were, even if you had the science to drive policy, if people didn't understand that, there could be resistance, right? So it was important to bring everyone up to speed. And that was, you know, giving the sharks a voice. That was, you know, allowing people to understand, oh my gosh, I'm afraid of sharks, but they guard my fish stocks. I got it backward, right? There's no future for me as a human if there's not a robust future for white sharks. Because, you know, when you really zoom back out beyond the ocean and you think about the planet, right? It's about 70% ocean. The ocean provides us with two thirds of our air, 100% of our water, and many, several billion people a year per day, their food, right? So our air, our water, and our food. Okay, so and it's 70% of the planet. If the ocean's not working, the planet doesn't work. There's no life for us on land. It's 70% of the planet. So anything we do on land is almost moot if we don't have an operating ocean. Uh, and so that's why we focused on the ocean. And then when you get within the ocean, you're now looking at the system manager, the white shark. So it goes from the white shark to the ocean system to really ensuring there's a planet for us all that's functioning and operating, giving us the air, the water, and the food we need to survive as a species. Excellent stuff. Can I get you some questions from the chat? Sure. All right. The first one that came up for you uh, comes from David, who was looking at that map of all the different shark populations, the nine populations, and writes, I would have thought that the populations would meet or overlap. Can you talk about how those That's different nine question. entities interact? That's a great the... question. Really good. Interest. I don't, I've never really had that question. Well, they don't. Um, so when you think about a white shark and the body of water that it likes to live in, if you're a white shark and you're in a population that's in the northern hemisphere, to get to the, go to the, the population in the southern hemisphere, you have to travel through a massive band of hot water, you know, that's thousands of miles wide, right? So we don't see them crossing over a lot. Now, that being said, when you look at the genetics of the different populations around the world. You can identify a female white shark by her genetics because think about the female. She doesn't need to leave the, the population, the region she's in, right? She just needs to continue to thrive and mate every year and make pups. Now, if you were a male white shark and you came into a situation where there was a lot of other big males, kind of like think about lions, a younger male might get pushed out and might decide to go wander to try to find somewhere else, some other population where he can succeed more and mate, pass on his genetics. Um, and so we do see when you look across the world on the genetics of the males that there has been over the 30 million years that white sharks have been around some small crossover in the males that can kind of show some populations that are related, or it happened so long ago, you know, that as the earth has changed, they separated, right? So, um, so we do see some populations that are somewhat related based on the genetics of the males, which means like one shark every three or four generations might have made the crossing, like over that period of time. It's very infrequently, but a long period of time, right? So the believe it or not, the our white shark off the east coast is most closely related to the uh, South African white shark. The white sharks that are over in the Mediterranean are more closely related to the Japanese white shark, which leads people to believe that maybe way back, you know, when there was a different ocean and different paths around the ocean they were sharing that region and over time it became separated. And then you see our, our, our sharks off the Pacific coast are more closely related as you would guess to those sharks over in the New Zealand, Australia region. So there is not a lot of crossover, although over the 30 million years, there have been some males that have connected some dots or over that period of time, as the continents shifted and moved, populations separated and traveled into what we see now. So excellent question. Not much crossover. Good stuff. All right, next one for you. How do you approach advocating for fisheries management in areas beyond national jurisdiction, ABNJs? Yeah, it's hard. You know, it's hard uh, to do that. You know, um, when you get outside of talk about high seas and other things like that, um, mm -hmm. 
I think the one thing that our work is leveraged for that does affect fishery management when you when you, in relationship to a question like this is that, for example, because we're tagging these large apex predators as we move around the world, that, devers, that data is constantly leveraged when they're creating and managing marine parks. So, for example, here's here's this one example: uh, the Revilla Hijalos Marine Sanctuary off of Mexico. It's about 200 miles south of Cabo San Lucas and about 200 miles west of Puerto Vallarta. It's right, right there. There's a, a series of islands called the Revilla Hijalos Islands, and it is a magical place. It is the Galapagos of Mexico. It is one of the most amazing places I've ever been. When in the early years when we were there, it was not a big park. You know, they kind of maybe looked after one island, had a mile around it or whatever. They decided to collect all the islands together and create a, the largest marine sanctuary in the world. It's now at the Revilla Hijalos. When they originally designed it, it was going to have a three mile ring around all of the islands that were clustered together there. And that was the boundaries of the park. But when they went and looked at the data for all the work we did there back around 2012 or 10, um, we tagged a bunch of tiger sharks there. Those tiger sharks were going out 27 miles every night for their evening foraging run. So they expanded the park to 30 miles surrounding all of the islands, right? So our data is used a lot like that because they've never had tracks of these big animals. These animals are the balance keepers of the park. Right. So you can't have them going out over the line every night and getting whacked at the three mile line and then they can't come back in and balance the park. Right. So so that our our, our data is leveraged a lot like that for various different uh, types of management issues that do affect international regions and things like that. Most of the time, if you have good data and you're in you're pursuing commonsensical objectives, uh, you know, you can you can achieve a, a result that's better than our current state. And, and our data is leveraged a lot like that. Excellent. All right, next one comes from uh, the YouTube username is Outer Banks Adventures. Hi, Jamie. Uh, last year, there was a great, there was a small great white caught off Jeanette's pier at Nags Head. Is any plan to collaborate with other organizations like North Carolina Aquarium, CSI to share research, maybe through the use of tags? So we do collaborate already with the University of North Carolina Aquarium. They're on the team. And um, so uh, along with a lot of other people. So again, on our team right now, there's 49 scientists from 25 different research institutions strung between Nova Scotia, Southern Florida, and the Gulf of Mexico. So what we typically do is as we see the whole range of the animal develop with those early first couple tags we put out, we then begin to build a massive collaborative team from across that entire region so that as we give those scientists the big picture of what's going on, then you'll see as OSEARCH, the ship, and this bigger kind of tip of the sword research moves, we're going to move to another region of the world here before too long. Um, then all of those scientists now go back to their institutions and they know now that, for example, in North Carolina, between November and May, you could have a full-blown apex predator research program and you have predictable access to white sharks. They didn't even know that before, right? So I think you're going to see those scientists going back to their universities, institutions, and you're going to see these smaller, more local white shark research projects popping up in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, the Florida, and the Gulf. And, and obviously they already know, and there's, there's some have popped up up in the Northeast. But for example, when we started this work, no one knew there was white sharks in Canada. They said, oh, there's not hardly any white sharks. There. No one said there was white sharks off of Florida or off the Carolinas. This is just 10 years ago. And now we know they live there, right? So nothing's changed. We just know now. But so we're seeing institutions now at popping up in, in Canada. It's kind of the nat natural evolution of OSEARCH. We come in, we lay out the blueprint of what's going on so that it can get to a level where they can manage it locally. And then because we've connected them all now already on this big collaborative team, they continue to communicate across the region as to what they're seeing and what's going on. So that's, I think, what you're going to see. There's going to be several white shark programs popping off. And, you know, for example, I, I it's none of my business, but when you look at a place like University of North Carolina, Wrightsville Beach and the universe and, and the North Carolina Museum, they didn't even know it, but they're set up for a prime time six month white shark research program every year from November through May or whatever. So 
it, it's fun to see those pop up and you just hope that they pop up with the same sort of collaborative spirit um, that was the reason why they even knew they could have a project there. It's uh, like hearing you say that makes me excited because, well, I mean, I would love to have a great, you know, white shark researchers right here in North Carolina on a regular basis doing this work. And, you know, for example, coming in here to the museum in Raleigh and sharing their insights because North Carolina's beaches, the Outer Banks, the Crystal Coast, these are all places that people across our state and across the Southeast even, right? These are the beaches that we all go to every summer. Right. Memorial Day is coming up, right? We're going to crowd the beaches full of people. And uh, the more, I feel like the more of the the science that we can get out there and the more that North Carolina as a state and these state institutions are engaged in good collaborative and communicative work about the oceans then and the more places that can share yeah. up and you have some good right. programs there you know you got university of north carolina rights will beach you got duke is right there uh yeah. near moorhead city there's another big institution there so now at the prime time they could they could and then what they can do is they can focus on more of these local questions while they're here for these three or four months, do they have one beach they like more than another? Do they have one point they like more than another? You know, we're coming in with zero data and providing a framework that allows us enough to manage the, air, the, the animal, but then there's lots, hundreds, unlimited local fine scale questions that research organizations could have in the, in the regions that they're from. So hopefully we'll continue to see that develop in a positive way. I agree. I like that future for us. Great grandkids first. It's pretty simple. There you go. <laughs> Chris, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Everybody stay well. Have an amazing summer and celebrate our abundant ocean because it is charging. You know, one of the things I will say too to people in North Carolina, especially to the parents who are my age, right? So I'm in my early to mid 50s. We grew up in an ocean that was so highly compromised, we could just kind of blindly walk down to the ocean and just stroll in and it didn't matter. I mean, we had wiped it out, right? Now it's back. It's a wild ocean. It's not the same ocean that we grew up swimming in as little kids. So what does that mean? What does that mean? You, you got to look at it before you just jump in it, <laughs> before you could just kind of jump in it. Um, now you got to look at it. Are there birds there diving on bait? Is there bait ball there? Is there is there fish feeding game fish on that bait ball, which is going to pull in the porps and going to pull in the sharks and pull in the system? You don't want to swim into the middle of the food chain. That is about the only thing anyone can ever teach you or help you to minimize the risk because the risk is already so low. There's almost nothing you can do to make it lower, right? The law of diminishing returns. So, but one thing you can do, like anything, if you're going into the woods, you should understand the forest. You're not going to walk into a herd of deer that are being stalked by a mountain lion, right? You don't want to swim into the middle of the bait ball where fish are crashing and the predators are going to come in to balance that system. That's really the only thing you can do. So look, and if it's going off, sit back and enjoy it. That's a result of us winning, right? That is a wild ocean. You're seeing things that people haven't seen since the 40s and 50s. Sharks crowding bait balls on the beach, red fish crowding bait balls on the beach, it's exploding. It's awesome. It won't last long, right? As it slides away and you find yourself in a nice quiet stretch of the ocean where there's not a lot going on, charge right in. But, but look at it. Don't just blindly walk in and most importantly, make sure you can understand how to identify rip currents. That's that's the real thing when you go to the beach. So, um, but the, the one thing you can do is, you know, respect and understand the system you play in. Just like the woods, ocean's no different. It's a wild place. Sage advice. <laughs> Basics. Yeah. All right. Well, that's thanks for having me. Always needs to be said. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You guys have a lovely, lovely Memorial Day weekend. Take a minute to remember all of those people that have created such a wonderful place for us to live. That is this weekend. And just please take a moment, even if you're on a walk to yourself and, and, you know, push a little gratitude out there into the universe for those that have created an, a, a place for us to live that allows us to do so much because it's just not the same when you go to other places. So happy Memorial day weekend. Happy Memorial day. Uh, I couldn't leave it on a better note. Folks, we'll be back here next Wednesday. 
for the lunchtime discovery series. Be well, be kind. See you next time.